You're listening to Wastoids. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is, therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? Well, it's whatever you need it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work or not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. As a special offer to Waste Toys listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash wastoids. That's betterhelp.com slash wastoids. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Everybody, it's the Spindle Podcast with Mark and John. Hi, and welcome to the Spindle, a podcast about Seven Inch Records. I'm Mark. I'm John. And in each episode, we talk about one Seven Inch record. We give you some insight into it that you haven't heard before. We both got into music in the '80s and '90s when Seven Inches were super important, especially on independent labels. So that's the era we mostly draw from, but we pick stuff earlier or later than that, too, sometimes. Either way, we try to keep it short and to the point, just like Seven Inches do. So on this episode, we are talking about Pavement's Slay Tracks, colon, 1933 to 1969. (laughs) It's a five-song EP released in mid-1989 on the band's own treble kicker label. It was recorded in January of that year in the uh, Gary Young's Louder Than You Think studio in Stockton, California. So this is the first EP that we've actually talked about. Everything else has been one song on each side. Are we breaking the rules by doing this? Or is it just, <laughs> no, no, I mean... It's I mean, the it's right what's... size. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a 7-inch. But I mean, a lot of the 7-inches I like from that era are EPs. Um, right. Because so many bands were into playing short songs and also... Sometimes I feel like bands often made their songs short so they could put more songs on seven inches. Not that I'm yeah. suggesting the pavement did that, but I, I think it's possible. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, they were, I think so. they said they were into it, it at the time, like right before this came out, there was a Swell Maps comp that came out. Mm-hmm. And uh, that featured, of course, their classic, you know, shambolic minute 45 tracks, just mm-hmm full of noise and experimentation, but ending really quickly. And you can totally hear that all over this record. Right. And they've, I mean, they've said that, but it's just definitely comes off of that ramshackle rough trade clutter punk kind of sound. It's funny, the history of the, of, of them and this record. So personally, you and I both being from the DC VA Virginia area might think of this more than some people do, but I I sort of think of their early history as tied up in UVA because David Berman went there too. And, Nastanovich went there too and so so much of what they ended up doing was involved with Charlottesville but this this was this happened right after Malcolmus Steve Malcolmus graduated from UVA went back to Stockton where he'd grown up he'd been in bands with Spiral Stairs or Scott Canberg and so and so they just did I guess they had thrown together a couple songs under other names and stuff and they just decided I guess Malcolmus was about to <laughs> this is kind of pure Malcolmus he was planning on going on a trip to Europe I guess he was going to do his Europe backpacking thing. And so they thought they should try to record this before he left. Right. So it's basically just the two of them. And, right. uh, you know, and then they go into this studio, a Gary Young guy who's a guy who has a studio in their town. Somebody recommends it to him. And while they're in there recording, he's like, maybe I should play drums on a couple songs. And they're just like, sure. So right. he ends, but, he well, ends, I think a lot of the drums, it's only like one track, right though. But isn't spiral drums on spiral and, and Steven. I think there's two tracks that Gary Young plays on and then one that the two of them play on and one that Spiral plays on. And then like the first song doesn't have any drums, I guess. So. Right, yeah. Again. The sign, the sign, the 
the quotes I've heard are Malcolmus and 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 Spiral both seem to think that it's almost it was a sort of about Stockton or not about stuff, but like the songs were kind of written there and and more about their experiences growing up there than they were about anything that that the two of them had done after high school. It's a, it, it, so that's interesting. I mean, I'm sure your perspective because you you also were from went to William and Mary and stuff like that. Right. I always it seems like a very California record to me. Right. Oh, there it is, yeah. there there are other records of theirs though that I think I know what you mean and and mm-hmm. I I did not know about his Virginia background at all until much later. And what was weird is and he he has, you know, I have a degree in history. I'm from Virginia and stuff like that. And there was stuff that would I would be like, man, that just is something hauntingly familiar about this outlook, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> that I'm like, why does this ring like that? And so to later on find out about that connection, and it's sort of like, oh, OK, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there is something very UVA about the approach and. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Though this record less. This seems more deserty, this record to me. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Like I um, think Crooked Crooked Rain's a very that's a very Virginia mm-hmm. Virginia esque East Coasty kind of record to me. Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but no, I think I think that's something that that came out sort of more later as they progressed, especially once Bob Nasanovich was in the band and stuff. And yeah. um, it's interesting too. Listening back to it recently, I hadn't listened to it in a while. You know, it opens with a song that's that probably anybody who gotten into pavement like only based on their later records would might not even recognize that you're killing me song, but then box elder comes right after it. And that, I mean, that's almost like the blueprint for so much pavement later. I mean, kind of, I don't know. I always, I always think this is like, uh, maybe I'm just being chauvinistic about it, but (laughs) I think there's two pavements kind of like there's this Uh earlier, more studio based one. And then there's the band pavement. And this this project is this is a more project based sound I'd say all the way up through watery domestic right mm-hmm. and it did so especially this one's just pure studio kind of right um, and I don't know it's just got a really really different vibe I mean Box Elder is definitely kind of a poppy song but all of those mm-hmm. are like you know right. she believes in me that's nuts mm-hmm. that song it's so good and it's, <laughs> yeah but then but like later pavement seems to me to have a lot more twists and turns to it and mm-hmm. he gets into jazzier chords and stuff and this is all very much just very straight ahead even box right. elder is like almost jokingly sarcastically straight ahead as a song uh-huh. mm-hmm. right which so. apparently is a spiral written song I think yeah, it's right. the only one on there, which makes, I mean, it sounds like some of the stuff he did later, sort of. It does. When, when he would get one song on every record or whatever. Yeah, right, um, right. <laughs> and of course, that um, was impossible to know at the time, but right. it's, it's right. the best song. I, I mean, it's the best song on there. That's a really great song. Like the little bit of mysteriousness about it. Like, what is it? A box, a box elder. And you know, of course a box elder is a plant and it's a shrub, but it's also a place, I guess. Like, I like how incomplete it is. It's, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause at one point he says box elder Mo, which means box elder, Missouri. Right. Then it becomes a civil war song or something. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, this is part of the lore that most pavement people probably know, but if people don't know early pavement stuff, part of what helped them after this is the wedding present cover, that song. Yeah. Not, not Great much version. Long after. So good. Yeah, which really good so version. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess is is through possibly through John Peel having played the pavement version on BBC and they heard it there or something like no. that. No. My no. understanding I read was that Mark Eibold was because he was in Dust Devils, oh, right, was right, friendly right. with the bassist from Wedding Present and right. gave him the seven inch. Gave him the, right yep. when it came out. 
You're right. You're, but I don't think he knew the pavement that. people at that point. I will. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's that's exactly right. Yeah, I would do remember writing that too. Like he would, he didn't even. He just it gave was it the to newest him as, sensation. It was yeah, like, ooh, you know. Yeah, that's so funny that he gave it to him as a fan without any inkling that he would be actually in the band later. I think those that's guys funny. are big record collectors. I recall like right. George from Vinyl Inc. saying those guys would come over and mm -hmm. pick him clean a little bit. Right. Right. I one, uh, I'm trying to th think, you know, I mean, it, it, it got them onto labels, but it was on their own label, but it, I guess it was just easier for things to get around. I mean, there's a story that Malcolmus, once he went on his European trip, the record hadn't even been pressed yet. And he was in a record store and he heard it being played and didn't even know that it was out. <laughs> there were still really pretty decent independent distribution in the U S in the late eighties. Mm -hmm. Um, I, you could name some names, but Mortem comes to mind as somebody mm -hmm. that, you know, did a lot of distribution mm -hmm. and you could get a record like that just 10 and 20 at a time. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, even with scat up and running at that point, they would do mm -hmm. distribution mm -hmm. and you could sell 10 records here, 20 records here and mm -hmm. sell out of pressing like that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and get it around. And, uh, the other big thing of course is college radio where you get hold of a, one of the cmjs and go into the back and just pull out every you know relevant address and just mail out a million records to that but it would work i mean i've got a you know it worked even as late as 90 it was still mm -hmm. working you know definitely <laughs> so but it would yeah. go everywhere i mean those would get around and and mm -hmm. i mean even my stupid band single you know people got them in taiwan and you know when we got a, the first one in particular when we were able to get that kind of distribution it was crazy how far those records would go you know, and there was a lot of transatlantic trade and stuff like that. Different time, you know. Right. Totally. Totally. So my understanding, though, I don't know if it was based on this record, but wasn't there a point where Marky Smith was basically like, they're, they've, they've ripped me off completely? I th well, I think it's two states <laughs> is what he probably heard. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. I don't think he, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think this sounds like the fall particularly. Yeah. I, there's record. a couple of songs that it, it kind of, I mean, I, I feel like there's, Part of um, Price has a little bit of a fall sound too, but that's well. I mean, there's no question they've heard the fall and like them, but I'm just saying it's right. like there's definitely later things they do that are very much fall more fall. Conduit for sale or what's the one? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just a complete ripoff of yeah, um, right. A lot and a lot of slanted in general has much more of a fall right. sound. Than that's this, more fallish, but, but yeah. I don't know. He, you know, he he probably he 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 would say that about anybody, <laughs> <laughs> right? So. I, I think that, you know, you, you're like, oh, he knows my name. That's how I would mm -hmm. be, you know. It's probably because the the his band is playing it in the bus and he's like, oh, uh -huh. God, that shit again. You know, can't we listen to, can't we listen to Rockabilly? Uh -huh. And instead they're playing the latest college rock. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things I've always, I always liked about this and the next couple seven inches that they did was like, and they they there are there are obvious influences of falls and fall and swell maps and and i think map said chrome at 1.2 and they weren't like trying to hide that they were influenced but i also don't think that it just none oh, of it yeah. none of it sounds like a copy of anything oh not at all no no i think it's great especially the first one very out of nowhere kind of sounding and just like anything you can hear sort of mm -hmm. where it came from but they right. kind of never did they the first those first records that's they definitely went in a more songwritery way mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. Like these are mm -hmm. all almost more like pieces rather than songs. Totally. Art pieces, sonic pieces, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, bricolage, collage and stuff right. like that. And yeah. then at some point he's like, oh, I better write some songs. <laughs> right. The real songs, you know, with beginnings yeah. and middles and ends and uh -huh. that kind of thing. And that definitely is a change, I think. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I really like about some like, uh you're killing me and some of these others just my radio just, my one, radio one, is one riff like is that. yeah yeah on the on like from that same time period because this right. wasn't right didn't this is they recorded a, some other songs that didn't get on the seven inch i think that's correct like those things that went on comps like one song came out on a chemical imbalance comp and right i think you might be right i mean the next one that came out on drag city was recorded in october of 89 so not much longer after this came out. So I'm sure even yeah. if they didn't have extra stuff, I'm sure that they had these some of these songs. You know, I'm sure that when they went to the studio, they could have recorded more. They were, I think they did this whole record in like four hours or something. <laughs> right. That was that was fun though because that record came out and everybody was they were people were definitely curious about what the second one was gonna yeah 
Yeah. And I, and I, I already, I mean, it must have freaked him out because then it's already like you just toss something off and it's like, hey, can you top mm. that? And it's like, well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I have no yeah. idea what I did. How could I possibly <laughs> yeah. top or not top it? You know? uh-huh. uh, and the second record, I think, definitely kind of suffers. I mean, I like it. It's great, but it's definitely, I think that that one, like they finally, they hit it again with the 10 inch. Mm-hmm. I think that's it's like the first one in the 10 inch are really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Perfect Sound Forever is definitely on the par yeah, with this Perfect one. Sound Forever. Yeah. 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 The Spindle will be right back after a brief word from our sponsor. From cult horror and sci fi to B movie splatter fests, to underground music documentaries, concert films, public access shows, indie label showcases, and original programs, Night Flight Plus is the coolest place online for weird and riveting viewing. Right now, Wastoids listeners can get $10 off an annual membership. That means access to Night Flight's library for only $29.99 a year. Head to www.nightflightplus.com backslash promo code and enter Wastoids in all caps. That's W-A-S-T-O-I-D-S. Enter promo code Wastoids at nightflightplus.com backslash promo code and get back in the days. And now back to the show. I mean, it's funny talking about the the fall influence. I've I've always felt like with them, the bigger influence on them with the fall is the titles and the artwork and stuff like that. Like, I think that's true too. Like putting the putting that nineteen thirty three to nineteen sixty nine thing seems like such a fall. Well, that's also a very British post punky, rough tradey kind of thing to do, like Crispy Ambulance or somebody like that, or a certain ratio. Uh huh. You know, I mean, it's. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, the same vibe. And I think I'm not just Malcolm's, but Spiral Spiral was into a lot of the British New Wave stuff, so he would have known right. a lot of that stuff. Um, they also have some very straight taste, though. Like they're very big REM fans, and they, they kind of tend more towards. I think over time, you could see these avant garde sort of things were just a, a little bit of a dalliance that right they kind of moved off of pretty quickly. Uh huh. You know, not that it didn't inform what they did later, but it's kind of like there isn't much of that wowie zowie is sort of last gasp for some of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, this is the noisiest thing they ever did, and it's not. The funny thing is, it's it's partially because well, they 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 didn't really have a lot of time or a lot of money or a real big you know fleshed out songs yet. But I also think to their credit, they they didn't. This isn't just noisy because because of those things. I mean, they take advantage of the fact that like, okay, we're we're primitive now. We're gonna we're gonna you know like the the first song starts out with a bunch of sort of edited together feedback, and I mean they used it as a, as a as a device and a technique, not just oh we don't have it, enough money to make this sound slicker. It's a really you know? well recorded lo-fi record. Right. Like that's Absolutely. that is not a bad sounding record. No. Like you can hear every sonic detail. weird that it that they sort of got lumped in with lo-fi because none of their stuff is actually lo-fi in any way it's recorded on a really nice four track reel to reel by a guy who knew he was what he was right. doing right you know and and uh whereas i mean i think i sebado has got to be the classic example of an actual lo-fi right and with the mm-hmm. four track and mm-hmm. you know clicking and noise and cassette yeah. wharf and stuff like that yeah and it's yeah. it just it always struck me as odd that they were called lo-fi it's not low fidelity <laughs> no. no i mean it was recorded in a studio at that at that at that right point at that point in time that pretty much disqualified it from being called lo-fi even if even if half it's not inch, i think it was half inch four track reel to reel which would have been you know which is if yeah. you limit yourself it's going to sound beautiful you know right right which totally. it does it does yeah, and gary uh, young knew what he was mm-hmm. doing his records all sound really good yeah <laughs> like that's what true. he were the stuff he recorded with them sounds fantastic yeah i i think anyway it, mm-hmm. it always sounds really uh natural and lively mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
It's funny because I at the time I remember part of the the whole appeal with them was this kind of enigmatic, kind of like w- what exactly are they doing and who are, you know how arch is this versus mysterious, how mysterious yeah yeah and how how arty is it supposed to be, which I feel like that's a little bit of an REM influence there too actually being obscure about it a little yeah, bit yeah like being a, Michael but, Stipe yeah kind of riding a line though too like I don't think they wanted it to be like impenetrable art anywhere near something like that they just more wanted... rem than the fall <laughs> i think so in a weird way that that kind of a, approach to things because rem would do those weird little you know things on the on the back of the covers where they s- title the song what what it wasn't really titled or they put them in the wrong order on the back you right know, mild little things that aren't hugely like they're not saying like we belong in a museum but More they're also <laughs> part- and particularly early on the way michael stipe behaved on stage was very obscure you right. know, and and he had all of these like it, it, he kind of I mean, he still kind of did a little bit of it. But early on, way more of a almost a performance arty approach to right. it with like real extreme sort of behaviors and, mm-hmm. you know, hiding from the audience or right. crouching down and not interacting at all. You know, performatively, performatively, you know, yeah. in a good way. It was a good, right. good performance but with a purpose. Yeah, yeah. Right. With a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Do we do do we think that anybody got influenced by this? I don't. I mean, I remember later once they got were doing full length albums. There were bands that I felt like what was that band Archers of Loaf or whatever. That sort of felt like they were kind of taking the pavement aesthetic a little bit. But I don't. I don't know that any. I mean, there's Wingtip Sloat. Oh, I think yeah. Uh, I think Guided by Voices changed their entire approach based on this record. Really, really. I wow. would well. I mean, listen to those early Guided by Voices records, mm-hmm. and then listen to them after 1990. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you can. I think and and that whole Shrimper thing didn't that come up kind of? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I, I would not say Sebado. I would say the two of them, this record and Sebado, would be sort of the birth of that right that whole thing right. is maybe i'm uh-huh. generalizing but yeah no in terms of lo-fi or or not necessarily lo-fi but just sort of bedroomy uh, bedroom noise pop whatever you would call this stuff right and right. uh um so i would say that it, but it also might be seen as kind of a culmination you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's weird to uh, it's like th- th- today i because w- i've been listening to a lot of malcolm solo lately and i and i i listened to this coming into talking about it, think trying to sort of imagine, could I have guessed what he would play guitar like now based on yeah. <laughs> this record? And it's, I mean, I can't, I wouldn't have been able to. No, no. Which obviously so long ago, he's done so much stuff since then. But like, he's kind of a, you know, he's turned into this sort of guitar, I don't know what you call it, a proggy guitar player. Yeah, he spent a lot of time practicing at one point, you can yeah, hear. Yeah, I guess you know. so. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like it, it just, just sitting back and looking at the arc of the career, it looks like, you know, the first stuff was way more knockoffy, And then at some mm-hmm. point he's like, well, I might as well get a career out of this mm-hmm. and kind of changed up his approach with Crooked Rain. And it became a little more, I mean, they're never too serious, but you plainly he's thinking a lot about how he constructs songs. There's a lot of, it seems tossed off, but it's it's not you know kind of stuff uh-huh. and uh he's an excellent guitarist i yeah. i like i i think he's a great guitarist you know oh i do too i do too i think he's had a really interesting career since they stopped yeah but... how i have i mean i like some of his solo albums better than others oh i do too i think he has a couple clunkers actually but but there's something good in on everything and and uh and he hasn't I mean, he found he sort of found a lane, but he has he's been able to find different things inside that lane a little bit. It's funny what you say about tossed off, but not. I mean, I think that's the one thing that they were able to sort of hang on to for quite a while, even after they got more song oriented. Everything is there's some, there's some songs all the way up to even right in the corners where the what makes those songs good is the fact that they sound still a little bit like not completely together right but they're but they're able to stick together actually they kind of follow each other through paths that aren't i don't don't know what what the best way to call that i think of that song stereo or something like that you know sure oh no no i know Mm. what you mean it's Mm. it's they tried to keep it he's it's when i say studied it's interesting because he to me i can hear him like he does throwaway lines right Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. they're throwaway lines like right. he's put it in there as a throwaway line i'm making a <laughs> right. throwaway line right which is a way of giving you the vibe of things are loose things can change 
you know, I'm willing to just chuck this stupid rhyme in here, uh-huh. um, you know, and and it gives it a sort of a, a that relaxed right. feel that, you know, but that's a voice that's like he figured out how to put all that together. Right, right. It's not a throwaway because he needs to throw, he needs to fill up a line. It's throwaway because he likes the idea of writing a throwaway line. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a literary, it's a literary yeah. thing. You know, it's, it's a writerly thing to do. I love that record. When it came out, I loved it. I loved it unreservedly. I was just so stoked about it. It sounded great. It it like was so imaginative, you know, mm-hmm. while still very much coming out of a particular tradition. It's right. I mean, I was doing the same stuff on my boombox, not that I'm Steve Malcolmus, but it just it was definitely in the air at the time. And so it was cool to see it pop up like that. A hundred percent. And um, you know, it was for the next year or so, it was a lot of fun. I would just take, I had a tape that, you know, I would just, every time the new seven inch come out, I just stack it up behind the other, like on a 90 minute tape, just recording oh, nice. it so that I uh-huh. had all that on one side. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, it is sort of amazing how, I mean, it, this is a little bit sort of retro fitting it to what I think about now, but I do feel like I had a distinct feeling when I first heard them, this and the next seven inch, it's like, this is something that makes sense makes so much sense to me in terms of the way they're approaching music, the influence, the things that they kind of sound like the way, the, the kind of sort of semi enigmatic obscurist, but not totally out, out, out there. College radio just, rock. Baby. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it was, it was college radio DJs. It, it was, it was, <laughs> it was catnip. <laughs> catnip to us. Yeah. Which is funny because it's not like it, it's not like there were, uh, it, it was part of a scene or, part of a like oh they you know they heard this other band that's good right now and they're they want to jump into any uh, yeah no it's impressive that it came out of nowhere there's totally. nobody from stockton there's still no <laughs> other band right. associated with them yeah it wasn't no connection at all you know mm-hmm. so it's impressive that they just pressed that thing up and sent it out there and blew people's minds there's something a little a little inspiring about that yeah but of course it's fool's gold <laughs> You know, so many people probably were. I mean, I think they're part of that kind of pre-Nirvana. People were mm-hmm. inspired by that. And, right. um, you know, you had a lot of bands pop up around that time. Right, right. And it was a, it was one of those times where even beyond the below the level of like major labels are looking for something like there were tons of people out there who wanted to find new things just like just on an indie level. I mean, Gerard and 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 the drag city guys and they you know they were going to try to perk up to anything they could find that sounded and at all at all interesting not that they didn't have a quality control but they were they were actively looking so yeah. when something would come by this it wouldn't be like oh, i don't have the time for it well and you that know? whole underground scene for all of those years was very much like what's the new thing mm-hmm. in a very positive way like who's right. who's moving right. the ball down the field like right. not are you imitating something if you managed to combine it with something new you know, even if it's something stupid like cock rock or whatever, it's still like, hey, that's different, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. And that drove a lot of it. And I think pavement were right there with that because they definitely, mm-hmm. you know, that just that sound was very distinctive, mm-hmm. you know, that mix yeah. of noise and catchiness. It's, oh, uh, Jesus and Mary Chain definitely comes to mind with a lot of that. Right, right, for sure. Uh, just yeah. to, just thinking of noisy and catchy, you know, uh-huh. it's got that uh-huh. same kind of crushing sort of noisy high Mm -hmm. static feedback and melodies all over it right all right well uh i guess we'll we'll wrap this we'll say this one's a wrap and that's a real another really another really good record maybe one of these days we'll do a bad record but we don't have any planned anytime soon so (laughs) thanks for listening and we'll uh, we'll talk to you next time The Spindle is produced by John Howard and me, Mark Masters. I'm also the audio editor.
Our theme song is by the great band Honey Radar. Our podcast is brought to you by Wasteoids, audio and video from Hello Merch. Find more podcasts and videos at wasteoids.com. And please leave a rating and a review of our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks. Thanks.